Hey, can everybody in the back here okay? Does this work out? Good. All right. All right, hey, uh, good evening. My name's uh, Eric Gunderson from, uh, from Mapbox. I'm joined by Alex Barr, also from, from Mapbox. Um, how many people in here have, uh, have made a map before? Fantastic. How many of those maps have not been a Google map? <laughs> That's awesome. All right, there are about probably a good 80, 80 hands just went up. That's pretty, pretty cool. All right. Uh, so, quick, quick, quick backstory. This is not really about mapping with Drupal. We're going to get into maybe a little of that later, uh, but we're going to talk about uh, how to design really custom and beautiful maps. And then you probably, which quickly brings up to the the point of like why we're sitting at DrupalCon talking about this, um, and, and and why there's a development seed site be, behind us. So. The, the backstory here is we, we got into making uh, map design tools to start telling much more compelling stories with data. And the reason we were doing that was because we, we were working at Development Seed, uh, an international development uh, tech company in, in DC, and trying to do really big data projects. And the tools to design really custom maps and, and have a lot of control over the style, and then actually the tools to make them performant online were, were just not there. So over the years, we, we, we started rolling our, rolling our, own, our own solution. Uh, and uh, today, you're catching us uh, as a kind of brand in, uh, brand in transition. Uh, we, we used to work with Drupal uh, for seven years. And, uh, and, up, and up until uh, just before, yeah, just, just last year. And have transferred over to, uh, to focusing specifically on uh, data visualization and making very uh, performant maps. And what I mean by maps is, is, is specifically web maps and anything that can go on top of, of a web map. Uh, the, the market for this is absolutely huge. I mean, we're, we're looking at over uh, a million sites using uh, Google Maps. And, and uh, you can't even customize those that, that much. With, with Mapbox, it's a, it's a service that allows you to uh, take your data uh, locally and actually start designing a totally custom map. Uh, upload it to the cloud and then be able to actually integrate this, uh, the map, into your own site or app. Uh, anywhere from dropping in a YouTube video, like, like dropping an embed, like a YouTube video, to, uh, to tightly working with, uh, with our API. And I, I want to walk through a really quick higher level view of, of how Mapbox and some of these open source tools can, can be used. And then I want to jump over to more higher level views of what's actually possible with these tools. Uh, and, and literally show sites and tell some of the stories that we were trying to do with, with these sites so you can get a sense of, sense of what's possible. And then uh, literally digress into some of the technicals around how, the, how those sites work and just kind of riff on, riff on that. Uh, we are then going to jump into a little bit of live, uh, live coding with Tilemill, uh, our open source design studio. It's going to be a whole whopping three lines of custom code, but you're actually going to get to see uh, what that looks like. And then uh, Alex is, uh, is also going to speak specifically to some of the Drupal paradigm uh, pieces. So we're going to move uh, fairly quickly here uh, during, during this hour. But uh, I wanted to first say this is not going to be a real intense deep dive around Tilemill. I know there are a lot of Tilemill users and some pretty serious Mapbox users here. Uh, our goal here is to actually talk about everything from strategy to really showing the art of the possible and getting into some of the technicals. Um, but for folks that are like, wait, should I be in here? Should I be in another session? But I really want to get technical about some of the map making. We are going to have a uh, boff uh, tomorrow. Oh. 1 p.m. room 502. Where we will get incredibly hands-on, literally walk uh, from, from a more detailed spreadsheet and really dive into some of the code and answer some of the questions. So uh, if, if anybody uh, wants to take that as a cue to sneak out. Otherwise, uh, let, me, uh, let me actually show you uh, how to publish uh, incredibly fast maps. Yeah, is that better? Cool. All right, so first, 
in, in regards to making a map, you, you basically have three sections here, right? You have a data collection side, you have an analysis side, and a map design side, right? You actually have to have the data, you have to figure out what story you're telling with it, and then you want to actually present that. Uh, we're not going to talk about the first two. We're only going to talk about the actual map design side. Uh, whether you're doing a data collection tool via like SMS, you're using Excel as your data collection tool, or you're actually using, uh, you're using a database, um, or using GIS tools like Esri or, or OpenGeo, uh, there, there are plenty of existing tools for that. Where we were getting uh, pinched was actually on the communication side of trying to tell, tell the rich, rich story. Uh, for us, this, this, this starts out with a tool called TileMill which is fully cross-platform, one-click install on Mac, Windows, and, uh, and Linux. And what this allows you to do is to actually take your data, whether this is a spreadsheet, whether this is your company's API, whether this is OpenStreetMap data, whether this is you know, communities, local data, uh, Esri shapefiles, like any data that you have, and pull it into the system and actually uh, start uh, designing out a map. Um, like I said, it's, a, it's an install so, uh, that runs locally on your computer. So here you can see TileMill um, with a spreadsheet pulled into it and you know, turning a few, uh, a few knobs and uh, running a couple uh, uh, color filters, you're able to start uh, scaling out and uh, telling a story uh, with, with uh, your data. I'm gonna actually try to get into some of the code later and not actually show, show the GUI. But you, you, you get a sense of how um, of, how, of, of, of where this all starts locally. Once you have your map, uh, you can then uh, literally export this, this out uh, to the cloud and actually in, in, uh, and, and put this online. Once it's online, you're able to grab a YouTube-like embed code, or like I said, our API, and literally drop it into a story and uh, have a fully interactive map alongside your content that can be shared anywhere. So whether it's a press release where you're dropping in a URL, whether it's like tweeting it, um, really trying to make data more social. And then uh, on, the, on the Mapbox side, what we're doing is we're monitoring uh, statistics for you so you can actually see who's looking at your map where and really manage all of your different, different maps. Uh, again, I just want to kind of gloss over the, the life cycle here. Uh, but what's, what's important about this is that this map, it's just a basic slippy map, just like a Google map. It has these tiles, these squares, right? Everybody that's ever loaded a map in a low bandwidth environment or a bad connection has seen like squares slowly load, right? We're in the business of making custom squares, right? Just like Google. So you can put them on top of Google, you can put them under Google, you can put them on top of Bing, on top of OpenStreetMap, right? This is, this is a very established standard, the, uh, these actual map tiles. And whether they're on top of a traditional map or actually integrated into, into a, a, an application, you're, you're, you're talking about uh, just basic map tiles, which means anybody using Google Maps right now uh, could actually switch to your own, your own custom maps. Uh, so let me very quickly, like in the three minutes, walk through what it's like to make a map with tile mill using slides, so I stay focused. And then we'll get into live demo later. Um, so all this starts, uh, as you saw, with tile mill actually running, running locally here. Uh, you can see I have a couple different map projects, right? This is just tile mill, as soon as it opens up, on, on my computer. And here I can go in and create a new project up top. And immediately I get a fresh canvas here of a live interactive, interactive map. Uh, like I said, this is about then being able to add your data. So I can go in, I can take a spreadsheet here, uh, see a, a nice CSV file, go in, browse, let me add this spreadsheet to the map. Now I can actually see the spreadsheet in the mapping application. And like I said, uh, I can quickly run some filters over this data here and make a map and then uh, actually export out that. And I don't need to know how this stuff works. There's really good documentation built in. Uh, all right, that, that was clearly oversimplified and I promise I'm gonna do a live demo later so you can, you can, you can see me hop around and, and, and get into some code. But once you walk through that step with TileMill, you're then able to actually publish this up. So I wanted to just show that as a full on life cycle of where tiles come from. Uh, so. Let me now transfer and, uh, and actually show what you can do with some of these custom tiles. Did I miss anything there? Okay. 
Cool. Uh, I want to walk through this specific example that we were working on last um, last August into into September uh, during the actual uh, famine in in the Horn to really illustrate the power of telling complex data stories. You're hearing a lot right now about open data, open government, transparency. Um, unless you have the proper tools to actually leverage and, tell and, and explain what's going on with the data, add context to the data, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it, you're going to have a hard time reaching a larger audience. So we partnered with one here uh, to uh, help, help have a longer conversation about why the famine uh, happened and actually start looking at uh, infrastructure issues in, in the Horn. So the fir first thing was to, say, uh, to talk to one's audience and say, hey, wait, what, what's going on? Okay, we, we have a famine. Um, uh, here's what it looked like uh, three months ago. We can actually zoom in to the famine area, and the situation is going to get worse, right? We want to actually orient people, and we want to describe what's going on right next to them in context. Okay. Why? It's caused by, it's caused by drought, right? So now here we're pulling up uh, open NDVI data. This is uh, actually showing a, a, a differential between uh, vegetation growth. So here I can actually see the growth in April 2010, and I can literally watch the horn turn brown um, over the course of a year. Uh, what, did, what happened here? It actually caused prices to go up radically. Here you can see I can mouse over individual price points for cities. This is all uh, open uh, data from uh, the FuseNet project, the Famine Early Warning System as part of, uh, part of USAID. Uh, they open this data up on, um, on data.gov. And you can see as I mouse over, I'm seeing five years worth of actual crop price data on a, on a monthly basis. You can see that the price spikes last uh, summer and fall were actually higher than they were during the food crisis in late 2007, early 2008. Um, OK, but like famine, famine is actually uh, made, made by people, not the environment. Uh, so let's, let's, let's uh, really get to the point of this. This is about a, a, a situation in conflict. Let's now look at that first map again and look, look just at the famine areas and actually show where it is in relationship to the hash areas. These are limited humanitarian access areas where we actually can't get to, where we actually can't get food out. Well, what's going on with people in those areas? Let's actually look at internally displaced uh, people here. I can see the, uh, the IDPs uh, clustered here. I can actually go and see the refugee camps outside of the country. I can mouse over and see a demographic breakdown uh, by age of who's in those camps and the influx. You can see at the very bottom where the uh, peak starts coming in, that's May, right? You think back to the NDVI data we were just looking at when everything turned brown, that was April. I can, I can literally zoom down into this data and see the individual camps and the breakdown there. But more than just creating like a common operating picture of what's happening, I'm then able to zoom down and do a really deep dive here. Here I want to actually look at Mogadishu. This is all using OpenStreetMap road data. And the areas in red are actual camp data from the UN, uh, UNISAT. And the uh, black areas within the, uh, these camps, as I mouse over, I can actually see uh, the number of shelters. Those are actual tents. I can literally hijack this presentation. I just did a Right? I basically just did a flyover of the camp city in Mogadishu and was toured through that. Uh, this isn't even HTML5, right? This is, this is just basic HTML and some JavaScript. Uh, the subtext of this site here is uh, that this is a pretty incredible open data story. We would not have been, been able to pull this off without being able to just go to certain websites and pull down data sets and start using them without um, you know, getting some bureaucracy in action. Um, Eric, how long did it take us to build the site? Three days. So uh, we had a warm team like that are really like you know trained on like building these sorts of sites. But like those are like those are in terms of like the power that you, like the, the, the the effort that you put into it are relatively small sites that uh, do a lot and that convey a lot of data and that are very very powerful. Um, All right. So on that on that note here, just um, I mean, let's see what. Power Yeah, what Eric's pulling up right now here is that um, how we integrated the site. Um, the one that works site is actually, what, what content management system is this running on? Do you know it off the top of your head? We don't know actually right now what the, uh, the content management system is of one that works, but you can imagine, you know, for all, for all intents and purposes, it's Drupal. Uh, but uh, the actual site that we are looking at, the interactive that we just walked through, is really just like a 
straight up HTML site with a lot of JavaScript on the, on the client. Uh, and it's all embedded really just with a knife blade. Uh, this is a really interesting and important point because specifically with uh, these sorts of campaign sites as visualizations, they usually, uh, you know, are, are uh, they capture some facts in time. Uh, and uh, them just being like straight up HTML makes them like a shoot and forget. You just turn them on, you put them on your server, there's no database that you need to go back, update, security patch, et cetera. Yeah, and again, so uh, audience-wise, we are, we're assuming here we're speaking to developers and people actually deploying sites. Like we want you to really understand what we're doing and how quickly we're thinking about building so you can literally take some of these concepts and quickly deploy. And as Alex said, quickly deploy in a really scalable way and forget. Um, I can't tell you how many data sites uh, that we've built, but I know some people in the audience can, uh, that are still running on pretty costly database servers now uh, three, four years after uh, elections. Important artifacts to keep up, but, but wicked expensive. So the actual code delivery here was literally an iframe. Um, and this is all powered uh, sitting on GitHub pages. Next example. Uh, the census came out in April-ish, uh, and uh, we, we partnered with NPR to actually look at the change in population with, uh, with, within, the, within the U.S. Here you can see purple areas, um, cities where they're losing, po or excuse me, states where they're losing population, uh, green areas where there are states gaining population. As I zoom in here, you get to see uh, counties start to emerge. Uh, you can see now, as I mouse over, I'm actually seeing a breakdown for the county. Uh, basically, these green donuts, that's suburbia. We can drill all the way down to the actual census track here and have all of this be fully interactive. That's over uh, 72,000 interactive features on this map, and you're getting a sense of how fast this is. This is fully mobile comp compliant and will uh, will downgrade for, for low bandwidth uh, environments. How, mu how much data was this? So the, the census file we started processing was a 300 megabyte census file. The actual geodata that you add to that, you know, like all the shape files for the counties and census tracts, that's probably another like 600 to 700 megabyte of data. And we can all deliver that like at the speed of web just because we bake tiles from that ahead of time and because we only deliver what you're looking at at that moment. And again, uh, the pop-up on the, in the sidebar here with the little graphs in there, this is just all coming from the map. Uh, again, allowing us to expose like a lot of data here uh, in, incredibly fast. Um, and before, you know, before I turn this over, over to Alex, the other thing I would, uh, if you can see the URL keeps changing as I pan. Anybody can quickly grab a link here and literally uh, tweet this and actually start having conversations being like, hey, look at this area in, in my city, and that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, it's, it's had more success even on the, uh, I think people have been talking about the FCC map site. Uh, they did a, a, a 3G blackout map, and you could literally tweet, and be, people were like, yeah, this is why my cell phone reception sucks on the what ride home, uh, and this was a, a U.S. government released map. Like, that's, that's awesome to actually have this stuff become, become social. Uh, but I, wa I wanted to show the NPR example to really show what a lot of data uh, looks like. So let me let me stop there and uh, uh, transfer this over over to Alex uh, for any examples. Can I flip up the story again? Yeah, I, I quickly want to show like uh, another example here for sorry for like showing a lot of data on a map. Um, this is a, a website that we did last year uh, for in about November for uh, the climate the climate summit in Durban uh, for the World Bank here. The World Bank has decided to open a whole bunch of uh, uh, climate data uh, to support and aid uh, the international aid community in their planning for future projects. Uh, it's becoming more and more clear that the impact of climate change will uh, be specifically important for international development folks as uh, some of the poorest countries are actually going to be hit hardest by it. So they uh, released here data that is actually essentially not, uh, not as much as like their own data, but data that they repackaged that they felt was really valuable for climate change. Uh, planning. What's interesting about the site is like I mean, the, amount, the amount of data we can show with these maps, but also that uh, we really just give you like a quick view of like, hey, this is the data. We could do a good visualization of this is the data that you can work with, and then we actually provide this data for a download, right? And in this case here, I'm going to do like a, f a full pop-up here. We're looking at 
about 700,000 data points uh, of uh, climate change prediction map, and we're looking at 2100 here. The dark parts of the world here are uh, where it's gonna get hotter. Uh, the bad news is, like, this is actually one of the optimistic predictions. It's the bad news is, like, we'll have here changes in temperature that are going to be, like, in the seven, eight, nine degree centigrade, uh, centigrade area, uh, which is pretty serious to give you an idea of uh, uh, w what this relates to is, like, we had from the last ice age about uh, a rising temperature from uh, of about five degrees centigrade, and we're looking at similar rises in temperature over the next hundred years. So these are the sorts of sort of predictions that they uh, that they uh, publish here, uh, and when you move over with the mouse here, you'll see how the graph changes here in the sidebar, and you'll see that for every single uh, cell on the map, we have a breakdown, a monthly breakdown that shows you. And uh, for those that are for the back, for the in the back here, the breakdown shows you like what is the average of today for each month, how does this average look like in hundred years from now. And what is like the 10th to 90th percentile around that? Like what is sort of like the error that they can be expecting around that? Error margin is obviously very large. Those are predictions, but uh, it is something to work with. And uh, like I said before, like what we do a lot in those in our in our uh, uh, mapping sites is we actually just provide the data for download. Uh, and again, going back to what I said before, uh, when we were looking at the famine, the, the Horn of Africa site, like a lot of these sites are possible because there's so much open data out there right now. Uh, we try to be like good citizens in this ecosystem and have the clients, especially the client th clients that we work with, also open their data in the formats that are conducive for you know creating maps, creating graphs, creating just like visualizations of data and really leveraging it. What I now want to do is actually want to jump jump over to showing what it's like to make a map from from scratch. Uh, this is my spreadsheet. Uh, in my spreadsheet, I have uh, a region column. I have a latitude, longitude. Uh, or well, hold on, let me back up. Sorry. So we. Uh, we were, we were working with the National Democratic Institute uh, around a, a tech camp with State Department in Romania. And uh, we were talking about ways to actually visualize all the partners they were working with on the ground. This is like something classic. It's like, wait, I'm, I'm working with a lot of cool people in country. I want to actually see who I'm working, who I'm working with and, and, and what, th what they're doing. And here's how you can see that, right? You all get a sense of what's going on, right? Right, no, but I mean, seriously, maps are just another lens on data. So we're basically taking the spreadsheet uh, that has a couple basic geo columns in it, uh, things like, you know, the name of the name of the party, the number of organizations, some people names, uh, what year, like really a basic spreadsheet. Okay, and we jump over to. Beautiful. Uh, so this is oh, hold on. no, no cheat. I'm going to start Tom a lot. Uh, this is totally a, a desktop. Uh, running application, uh, I can go in. You can see I'm working on a couple different maps here. I can actually go in and create a new map. Uh, I'll just call it a uh, DrupalCon NDI, and uh, there it is. Here you see I have uh, some CSS-like language in the side, and uh, I have a fully uh, fully interactive um, map here. So. Very quickly, I make some adjustments and I can change the color of my map. Okay, nothing's really special about changing the color. What gets exciting here is actually going in and uh, building out the map with your own data. So I can go in and add uh, certain uh, certain data. Let me first go browse. You can see here is my desktop. I can actually go in to my documents, which is my Mapbox folder. You see data, and here is this board parties spreadsheet that I was just looking at. So I add that. Cool, great. Um, Save and style, and there we go. I now see where everybody is on the map. That's still not incredibly helpful. Change that down just a little. Uh, it's also, I'm not trying to show violence, I'm trying to show friends. Let me change a couple superficial points. Uh, this stuff really matters. Design, uh, there is no such thing as neutral data visualization. Um, so be specific with your colors. You can make some incredibly ugly maps, and I think we can do that together today. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so I now have created dots on a map. Uh, this is definitely not the future of data visualization, but a lot of tools already allow you to do this. What gets exciting is starting to take control of your data. Here, I can go into that same spreadsheet I was just looking at, right? Here's my region column, here's my latitude longitude column. Here's my big, uh, the party organization listing column. Uh, here's the number, number of organizations column. And what's interesting about the number of organizations, right? What was the story I wanted to tell? Where, you know, how many people are working where? So let me actually look at this column. I can see that min minimum, uh, there's one person per, uh, per region. Maximum, there, there are 15. Uh, so what I can do here is very uh, quickly uh, actually start uh, greater than, sorry, greater than one, four. Uh, Alex, do you want to talk as I kind of just Yeah, here? so what Eric's doing here is uh, he's basically creating a couple of very simple rules to say, hey, uh, if the number of organizations is larger than one, make the dot a little bit larger. It's just gonna go through a couple of categories here and then make like larger dots as number of organizations is larger. That's one of the things that's specific about this uh, language that we call Cardo, uh, that we've created actually for this uh, specific purpose. It's fair CSS, like, uh, when I work with it, usually I, I have a couple of things off the top of my head, but there's a really great uh, inline search that you can crack open and, you know, you use it as, like, a, a good little cheat sheet, uh, basically, for, uh, for creating maps. So obviously, you can't, you can't, we can not only create, like, dot maps, we've seen a couple of, like, what we call core class maps, like these shaded maps, them with column as well. This takes a couple of different steps here. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. So what I was saying is that you can not only create dot maps, but also co what we call choroplast maps, like those shaded maps that we've seen before. For instance, in the uh, case of the NPR census map, um, these maps uh, are done in, in a very similar way. There's a couple of more steps involved. Uh, the place to uh, hit up for really getting the details on that is mapbox.com slash help. Or again, if you really want to do more hands-on here, like tomorrow at one o'clock, we're gonna do this pop. Now this What's the name of that? Cardo, C-A-R-T-O, like cartography, right? Okay, so uh, we're gonna keep taking breaks like this for another, t another two minutes. As you can see, I'm making progress here, right? I can now actually see density points of where, where my partners are. In, in country. I want to quickly uh, walk through what that code uh, looks like. Uh, and so people in the back can see it. Can people in the back see that kind of? Good, good. All right, so um, first I'm calling my spreadsheet. I'm saying give everything uh, a, a dot that's uh, three pixels wide. Uh, give it this beautiful shade of green. I want a little ring around it too. That's also a shade of green. When I have a lot of dots, I want them to be able to overlap. And then I'm looking at the column in the spreadsheet, this num orgs column, and saying anything greater than or equal to one or less than five, give a marker, you know, get, make a dot of three, right? Make a d and then anything greater than uh, five but less than 10, let's make that 10 pixels and 18. This is pretty basic, right? Great, cool, I'll pass it back. Oh, Eric, Eric, wh where, do the, where do the pop ups come from? Oh, oh. <laughs> So uh, if people have some questions as we're gonna do this, I wanna actually do this for like another three minutes to actually show how rich some of this can be. Okay. And Alex can just keep talking. Cool, questions? Here. Uh, question on the the you have to, right now, you actually have to categorize that through. I know what you're asking, right? Is, wouldn't it be great if I could just create a rule that says like, take like the scale of the data times two, right? Doesn't work quite yet. Uh, we're working on that. Something that, you know, it's, by the way, it's open source, so feel free to get involved if you, if you, if you feel like it, you know? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Another question, yeah. yeah. I have a question about the data source. Um, your data come from the uh, spreadsheet, the CSV file. Is it possible to use a database data? Very good question. Uh, we support a couple of, like Tilemo supports a couple of data sources. CSV is a very common one. GeoJSON would be another very common one. Uh, we support SQLite. Um, SQLite is incredibly powerful for uh, doing like mid-sized geodata stuff. If you work with QGIS, you've maybe, you may have used it and it's so nice because it's like a self-contained database file that you just can pass around and everybody can just open it. It just works like a database. We also support Postgres and PostGIS 
which uh, becomes very interesting when you want to do more heavy lifting stuff. Uh, like for instance, let's say you would like to theme a map made of OpenStreetMap data. Thank you. GML? No. Any other questions? Okay, the question was like, how would I plug this into Drupal? How would I make this feed off of data from Drupal? Uh, very good question, I'm gonna answer this in the, in the end. It's actually gonna be part of the talk. Over here. Uh, yeah, exactly, like a Google spreadsheet. goes down to zoom level 22. I don't actually remember offhand how, how that is, but that, this could be rooms in a, in a building. Yeah, zoom level 22 is very high. If you think of Google Maps, which has very high zoom level of support and it goes down to 18, 22 is very high. Also, like if you d decided to just use this like, um, you know, offside of like the mapping path, you could almost like, you know, render all kinds of like shape files in there, so. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, um, a data format that I forgot to mention before. We also natively support uh, Esri shape files uh, in, in Talmud. Uh, one last question here, the gentleman right next to the microphone. Hi. This is you, yeah. You, you mean like a, like like of the actual base map that you want? Oh yeah, yeah. So, you, oh good. I actually I think I, I hope. Are you going to show Opportunity Nation that shows blank spots? No, but we can show it. Okay, great. Um, cool. Let's go back to the code for for a quick sec. Uh, here, I've done a, I've done a couple things here. Um, I've kept my I've actually kept my my number filters and my width. I added something for, uh, or hold on, let me show you what I did. Right. Look, now I actually have the number of organizations per point. That was an extra uh, five lines of code. I now uh, am scaling the text also based on the number, and I added in some details about the text, what font I wanted it to use, what column I wanted it to look at. Um, I also cheated a little and changed the colors a little back to blue, added a little bit of marker opacity. Like I want to start tweaking this out. I want it to look good, okay? But now I'm only seeing, seeing data points. I still don't have a lot on this map. So let me actually walk through what it's like to add interactivity live to this map. So one, I need a legend. Uh, this is NDI partners on the ground. So what Eric's doing here is he's adding uh, uh, first just a legend, but now the actual interactivity is works a lot if you've ever worked with views we're using uh, something that, you know, on tokens in Drupal, it works a little bit similar. Like you just have like a uh, text field that you can fill with tokens that you would like to use uh, when uh, you hover over an element uh, on the map. And those tokens are for your convenience just like there on the bottom of the page. What's a little bit hard to see here in the back is that there are just the, the tokens that are listed out here are really just the headers of uh, my CSV file. And once you paste them into like the field up top, up on top uh, here, you'll get pretty much what you ex would expect when you hover over uh, an element on the map. The tokens will be replaced with the information that sits with this element. What's really cool here is that um, we have a way of um, putting this interactivity into, um, into tiles, uh, into uh, what we call UTF-8 UTF grid tiles that we then only deliver to the browser once you start interacting with those tiles. Meaning, you know, this is how we actually pull off the trick of like putting up a lot, a lot of data onto a map. And this is really one of the things that you would want to think of uh, about using Tilemill and, and Mapbox is, hey, I have so much data on that map, I actually cannot do that with, you know, DOM elements on top of my open layers map, right? This is like a little bit where we were coming from back then. Like we, we started to do maps where we had just too much information where our browsers would just not uh, be able to cope with that amount of dots on the map or with th those amounts of polygons on the map. So what you do is you go back to the tile level, right? So now I've made all my points scaled. 
with the number in there and interactive where now as I mouse over, I actually get the name in this particular uh, district. There uh, are, uh, there are you know, 15 partners and I can click to actually see more data in the full listing. So now I've built a fully interactive map here. Um, I can then, uh, I have my map layer, actually I can want to be able to put this on any map. I'm going to go in, I'm going to focus on the actual map because now I want to put this live on my website. Uh, that looks good, looks good, looks good. Get a title, NDI partner. So what's going on right now is like we upload this directly into a hosting solution. Um, and the reason why we have removed the back the map from the background here is because once we host our map, we can combine that with any other map that's hosted on the on mapbox.com uh, hosting. What TileMill just did there was it rendered out all of those actual tiles and all of that interactivity and publish it directly up to the cloud into my account. So I'm, curr uh, I'm currently uh, logged in. You can now see my map. So I can go and say, hey, uh, we've got a blog post to get out about uh, NDI data DrupalCon. Uh, and I want to turn on bandwidth detection. Good, let me hit save. Let me now actually go over to my different layers here. I can go into my account here and actually, uh, just a sec, internet, um, jump into my maps. You can see there's the NDI partners that I just uploaded. Great. Um, let me actually go in uh, and add some context to this. I can go over to the Mapbox account uh, where there are a bunch of layers uh, actually open here and I can scroll down and in this case, I can grab uh, Mapbox Streets, which is a world-based layer alternative. I can quickly drag the data on top of the map. That always helps. And now I can zoom in. All right, map's looking good. Let me hit save on that. I go back to my, grab that, grab my embed, go to my. And as Eric grabs your day embed uh, iframe, um, you can also, overlay your data over you know, a Google map or a MapQuest map. We've used here is like uh, our own street map of, uh, from, from Mapbox, Mapbox streets. And I've now published live from a spreadsheet to my website <laughs> in a little over 10 minutes. Uh, you can immediately get a sense of how easy this is going to be to actually integrate into Drupal. Um, and Alex will now speak to some of those, uh, some of those finer points. Cool. So um, there's basically two ways, and it came up before in a question here. There's basically two ways you want to think about integrating Mapbox uh, maps with, uh, with Drupal. And one is, uh, hey, I can just use like uh, those Mapbox maps as a, as a base layer, and then I put my dots on it like the, the old-fashioned way, like with open layers and with browser side DOM elements, or you know, be it like leaflet, whatever it is, right? But I really just use like this, like the, the base layer here, or uh, I do a data layer, a little bit uh, of how what, what what Eric just showed in in, in TileMill. So right, this would be an example here of uh, of a classic uh, sort of uh, base layer usage of Mapbox maps. Uh, we use, uh, in this case here, this is Denver. Uh, we're using here uh, the Mapbox Streets base layer, uh, zoom level 0 to 17, uh, open street map data. Uh, and we're using, in this case, I've used leaflet to put a dot on the map. And those could be many dots, but uh, you know, as I hinted at earlier, if this is going to be a lot, a lot of dots, the browser is just going to complain about it. And we're going to hit a certain wall, and this is where you would want to start thinking about uh, using Mapbox as a data layer, right? This is where we have the interactivity embedded, uh, uh, interactivity that can go like in lockstep with the visualization that you have on the map, just like we showed this on the NPR census map. Yeah, and for that interactivity, I mean, you've now seen numbers, you've seen names on, on Hover, you've seen graphs on Hover, but these could also be videos, these could be images, like you could be pulling anything into these interactive interactive points, and we'll actually show some what it's like to actually drop in uh, images in a, in a little while. I'm going to go through like the, the options here like with a big quick overview, but really consider this as an appetizer of what could happen tomorrow at, uh, at 1 o'clock in uh, room 502, so if you're interested in more like, hey, how do I integrate this uh, here with Drupal and what else can I be doing with those maps, just drop by tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Now, um, 
again, right, this is basically the question of like, hey, do I want to have about hundreds to thousands of uh, data items on my map or do I want to have like thousands to millions on there? Uh, the good old fashioned way, like I hinted at before, right, would be like, you know, you grab uh, open layers, uh, you use the Mapbox module together with it, and you uh, configure our open layers. I know it's always a little bit like a pain, but it works. Uh, you have, if you install the Mapbox module, you have like a Mapbox layer, you create that layer, and um, this is where I did not do a screenshot from. You create that layer and you configure it basically with the map uh, ID that you've created on, uh, on, on Mapbox hosting, or you just grab like the street level layer that we've shown you before and add that here and then you start you know using views or whatever it is to actually place those data elements on the map and this is you know part of your question that you asked before right this is one way of putting data that lives in Drupal onto the map now the other way would be uh, to do it exactly like uh, that Gary showed before and obviously there would be some sort of step uh, involved in between where you get the data out of Drupal and you would import it into a tile model and then you would render a map you would upload it now, you would very likely in this scenario use interaction. If you use interaction, uh, you want to be thinking about using WaxJS. This is uh, a wrapper library that we provide uh, for that we provide for libraries like Leaflet, Open Layers, Modest Maps. That does a couple of things, but most importantly, it makes it really easy for you to leverage this interactivity that's sitting in the, sitting in those maps. Because Open Layers or Leaflet or Modest Maps are not going to pick up on that interactivity that we deliver from hosting to you. By itself, so you want to be thinking of using WaxJS again. So this is something. This, this is something that we're going to be like talking about a little bit more tomorrow. To give you a quick idea of like what it would look like to use WaxJS, this is sort of the, the the minimum code that is involved in embedding a WaxJS map directly. Um, why would you do that as opposed to just grabbing the iframe that Eric just did like two minutes ago? The reason is because you have much more direct uh, impact on the map here. You can do neat stuff like, oh, let me pan around this, the user as he's like uh, visiting the map. Remember like the Horn of Africa map. Remember the zooms and pans that we did on there as you clicked around. This is all stuff that we, do, that we did with Wax, WaxJS and very simple WaxJS um, uh, plugins. More on that again tomorrow in Node 5 2. Now, Aside from data integration now, I want to point out quickly two more things that are interesting to think about. Hey, how can, what can it do between Drupal and Mapbox here? The one is there's a very powerful Mapbox API that allows you to in inspect uh, maps and uh, uh, galleries of maps on Mapbox hosting. You can do neat stuff like, oh, let me show for this user all the maps that the user has on Mapbox hosting. And in fact, there is a module I saw that come out the other day called Slash Maps that does exactly that. It just expects your Mapbox user account and shows all the maps that you have in there. You can do neat stuff like, well, just, just like listing, but you can also do neat stuff like, oh, let me just pull down the thumbnails for these maps and show me like nice little thumbnails here. So one thing that could be interesting to check out. Another thing that is interesting to check out is, hey, uh, how, how do I get my data out of Drupal and a little bit easier into time? Well, something that we do quite often, probably not as much with Drupal, but with all kinds of other operating uh, uh, content management systems out there is let us create uh, a data download from this website that you can just grab, drop into tile mill, and render a map from. And this is this can get very easy because the tile mill uh, supports remote data uh, sources. So what you can do is once your website, imagine it's a Drupal website, exposes like let's say all the the, the projects that a certain uh, organization has uh, all over the world, exposes them I as a data file. You can just put the URL of the data file into Tableau and start rendering that there, right? On top of that, um, you can, sorry, let's jump over that. On top of that, you can automate that process. So, right, once you have like your, data, your data file in, uh, in Tileml, you still have like the manual process of like, hey, let me go and now render and upload that map, just what we did before, right? You can automate all that from the command line as uh, Tileman has a command line interface and would look a little bit like that, for instance. This would, this would be the commands involved in like uh, rendering and uploading a map. There would be a couple of more parameters that I have not shown here that you would add, like you would say which project you want to render, you, want, you would say what user uh, you want to upload to, but this is basically how it works, right? And now, given the fact that you can just run, run Tileman in the cloud, like on, a, on an internet connected server, you can imagine that you can actually start automating this process. And in fact, this is uh, what we have set up a couple of times for, for clients. This is not productized in any way uh, from us right now, but like nothing stops you from doing this yourself, right? Just use Tileml as something that you run from the command, command, command line and that you, uh, that you run from your, from your server. 
And again, like if you're interested in like diving deeper into all of that, this is where we want to do like the rock bar. Um, <coughs> I think what's important is that everything you've seen uh, to to date is uh, free and open source. Uh, I want to now jump over. So like literally, even the cloud stuff that I pushed up to. I mean, those are that was like you can have a free account set up. Like you know, the first paid account starts at five bucks, goes up to fifty. You know, when, you know, when I, this is this is a classic. Uh, utility. I mean, we're we're in the business of selling ball bearings here, like we, that, that are transparent technology to power your maps on your site, and you integrate them. Um, that's 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 like how how our business model works. I don't want, but I do now want to actually transition over to talk a little bit about more about our API. But that API is also exposed from the free accounts. So I just I think a lot of this is it's really important that everybody realizes uh, the open source elements here, uh, even though we've packaged it up. Most of the time. Let's see which one of them is here. Yes, Pat Winters is here, I think. Excellent. So uh, we've done a bunch of work with uh, with Internews, um, an, an, an incredible uh, an incredible uh, media organization. Uh, they they are doing a significant amount of work right now in in Afghanistan. Uh, they were they were brought in uh, uh, by USAID for the one of the largest media development uh, programs in Afghanistan uh, recently. Uh, the, there, there's, a real, there's a real problem with trying to do, do media development. I mean, they, they literally stand up everything from radio towers to help uh, to actually help the radio stations figure out their business model to train journalists. Um, a lot of this stuff falls down when your journalists are getting attacked. It's really hard to try to create that, a, a kind of open, free media environment. Uh, we partnered with Internews to help uh, uh, tell a better story of what's actually happening in, uh, in, in, in country here, literally taking a spreadsheet, much like you just saw, and in this case, visualizing over the years uh, where there were attacks against journalists. This is a basic uh, one-page HTML site. These are Google charts, all dynamically rendered from the data download that we have. Here are the maps, just pulling from uh, actually uh, Mapbox. Uh, hosting, you can see here we've got some JavaScript that allows us to filter out different layers that we've made, right? So you can think in, in tile mill, I exported out like nine different layers. Um, as I click on different points, I can actually filter out my JavaScript listing. Again, there's no CMS, there's no database behind the site. I can turn on more complex data stuff. So, uh, how many map layers are here? So we at least have two, right? We've got a dot layer and we've got a terrain layer. What you're seeing here is that we're actually compositing this down on the fly into one single image. This is one of the real power benefits of, uh, of Mapbox hosting. Uh, we, we, uh, we're using Node.js for very fast, dynamic map compositing. Uh, so I can go to something like this. Let's turn on security instance for 2011. Let's just turn on 2011 data. Right? Any other mapping application, what would you have had? You would have had three callouts go out, right? You would have had one to the base layer, you would have had one to the actual dots, and then you had one to the shaded polygon. Like, you've all seen this. Like, the data gets painted on top of the map. That's not what's happening here because of compositing. What Sorry, can you show now how you would remove a layer? Right. So it's all it's all restfully uh, managed throughout throughout the API. This is a little bit of a ridiculous URL for anybody to want to read, but I'm going to delete a section and then I'll blow it up of what I delete. I just knocked out the security instance and recomposited it on the fly. That's what I deleted from the center of the URL. That means actually from your Drupal site or whether you're doing a static site, you can actually programmatically call against all the different maps that you're seeing. So when you see us actually start adding different map layers, right, you actually start treating your data like Legos. You just get to stack them up. So if you're working for a specific story and you want to have a couple maps ready to go, and then, hey, wait, the situation just changed. I just need to change one simple layer of data. You just go through the UI, the same UI you saw me dragging and stacking the uh, Romania dots w on top of um, Mapbox streets and, and put them on top. Uh, this really matters for low bandwidth environment. It also matters for mobile environments because mobile environments are low bandwidth environments. Uh, 
Eric, and can we have also a look at the UTF-8 grid with uh, Interactivity? Yeah, let's do, let's show two things here. Okay, back to another, another basic, let me go, let me actually show Big Data. Right, okay, right, another basic, uh, uh, basic tile. Again, we're just in the business of making custom tiles, right? Look at the end of this tile, it's a JPEG. Watch this. I'm gonna add 70 to the end parameter. It's gonna now change the quality down to 70. You guys know the difference when you export something out via, um, via Photoshop, the difference between like 90, 80%, 70, right? This stuff can get a lot smaller. Look at the noise around uh, some of the labels. See that's the distortion factor that we just placed by doing that, but that map's gonna render a lot faster. And you can build in this automatic bandwidth detection actually into your map. We launched this, this map with internews actually in Kabul. Like literally like there. Like, the, it, it's, it, like four years ago we were trying to build these rich visualization tools and they just weren't loading in country. When we were in country with, uh, w with Chris here uh, with NDI in uh, 2009 for the Afghanistan election, we were literally trying to set up local map servers and copy over you know, 2.5 million map tiles to have these maps load fast. Now you've got one single file, and on top of that, you actually don't even need to run it locally because of, of, of the actual uh, speed compositing happening here. So, uh, you know, to Alex's question about UTF, I, I want to actually, but all this interactivity here, like how, how is that working? Let me, let me actually jump over to a White House example first. Um, and I, I know we only have five more minutes. So, um, <coughs> uh, White House here, let me hit refresh. Um, the White House uh, has been uh, looking to uh, cut costs. They've been uh, actually looking at US federal excess properties. Uh, in this case, you're seeing over uh, 15,000 excess properties. Have you ever seen a dot map load this fast? That's fully interactive, right? Well based on a couple of the tricks that you, well, well, based on a couple of the tricks that you've seen, you know how we're doing it. We're baking these all into images. We've now reduced the problem here from 15,000 images, right? 15,000 dots to 15 images. And they're all interactive. And the way they're all interactive, let's go back to the Afghanistan example, is that behind each tile, is another tile of ASCII art that's actually a UTF-8 grid uh, literally showing the same kind of dots here and that's actually calling out the interactivity code. That's only triggered based on collision detection. We're basically running a pattern of four by four grid over each tile that allows us to do a collision detection for the mouse to actually show where we are and know when to trigger the interactivity. So back to the White House example, not only have we reduced the problem from 15,000 down to 15, we're only tr triggering the interactivity when you mouse over a specific tile. It lazily loads and goes, goes gets that little piece of, uh, little piece of JSON with it. Would you add anything else? Cool, um, so this is a preview of some of the stuff that's, that's possible. Uh, we're gonna be around uh, until the end of the day on Thursday. Uh, we're hanging out with our, with our friends at phase two that are gracious enough to throw us passes here and to let us uh, sit at their tables. Um, so stop, uh, stop, stop by. Uh, we'd love to get into the weeds about your data, uh, about telling stories. Um, we'd also, uh, I know there are a lot of shops here that are thinking about breaking into this and it's really hard to think about how you actually price for stuff like this. Um, we were able to uh, bootstrap Mapbox fully uh, through consulting work by a development team. Um, I'll be happy to share how we price overlays, how we price actual base maps, how many hours go into this, uh, to really help people in this room create business models, whether, whether you're a shop or whether you're an organization looking to outsource this to get a sense of what the costs uh, will look like. So I, I encourage you, stop by after, I'll be happy to give you a card. Um, Alex and, uh, and Jeff Mikolas, there, there we go, cool. Uh, Jeff also on the, on the Mapbox team, if anybody wants to get uh, actually talking about some of the cloud servers and the performance stuff, we'll be happy to talk about that. Uh, I would also love to show off Mapbox Streets um, and, uh, and also show uh, if, uh, if, uh, if we're getting some real traction there. 
uh, three weeks, we launched it four weeks ago with worldwide coverage. Uh, three weeks ago, uh, Foursquare left Google Maps for Mapbox Streets, and we're seeing a lot of other people start, uh, start making the move. Uh, so the cloud, uh, the reason I'm dropping that name is because our cloud service can absolutely scale, and uh, you should talk to Jeff about uh, how, that's, how that's working. So um, we'll be around all week. Uh, it's wonderful to be back with everybody. Thank you. Thank you.